everyone. My name is Mara Shaughnessy. I'm a program manager in the Office of Talent Management's Leadership Development Division within VBA. Welcome to the Distinguished Speaker Series. If you're new to the series, this event is a monthly virtual conversation that features best-selling authors and national thought leaders who volunteer their time to speak to us about topics related to personal and professional development. All our sessions are recorded. They can be found on our SharePoint site. And we're using a new platform this month. We're on WebEx for the first time. And right now I'd like to introduce um, our guest, Catherine Troutman. Catherine is the founder and president of the Resume Place Incorporated, the first federal job search consulting and federal resume writing service in the world. She is the pioneer designer of the federal resume format, which has since been accepted throughout the government and is the format used in usajobs.gov. Ms. Troutman is recognized as the designer of the federal resume by the Office of Personnel Management. She is the developer of the 10 Steps to a Federal Job, a licensed curriculum taught by more than 350 certified federal job search trainers around the world. She has contracted with more than 200 federal agencies since 1996. She is the author of numerous federal career publications, including the Federal Career Guidebook, 10 Steps to a Federal Job, the Job Seeker's Guide, and the Student's Federal Career Guide. Catherine, welcome. Thanks so much for coming back to VA. How are you today? Me too. Teach people my top tips on federal resume writing because everybody needs them. Let me, let me turn off my uh, voice here on my computer. That might help here. Hold on. Okay. Oh, there you go. Okay, so here we go. I have a PowerPoint here based on my book, The Federal Resume Guidebook. I wrote this first book way back in 1996 when the government moved over from the Form 171 to the resume. So the book has been around a long time, and the format is really unique. And um, hopefully you'll change your resume after this class and, you know, get better results. So my big um, – that's me there. I'm a federal career coach. <laughs> So the big news for uh, you all to know, these facts right here, this, is, this looks so simple, doesn't it? Your resume for federal should be three to five pages long, not two and not 10, and not 12, but five is really good because you may not know this, but all the resumes that go into USA Jobs and Disability and everywhere, those resumes are read by a human resources person, not a machine. The only agency that uses a machine to read resumes for skills and keywords is NASA. That's the only one. So your resume really has to be, you know, not too long and easy to read for HR people. And then also the HR people don't read the resumes in paper in front of them. They read it on the screen. And the screen resume is like four inches by four inches. So the resume really has to be easy to read. So try for three to five pages. Make sure the resume matches the announcement, and I'll show you techniques on that. Absolutely, you have to include accomplishments in your resume to stand out and try to get referred. And then the employment history has to be reverse chronological order. So those are the basics of a federal resume. Private sector resumes are two pages, so they're really, really different than federal. So private sector won't work. I'm going to show you that bullet resumes are not very good for HR since they're hard to read. and find the skills. A big block resume is kind of popular for some uh, fed people, but I'll show you how bad it is. You'll see. And then functional resumes are just terrible. They, they will just be eliminated. So don't think about using that. So look at this. That is the format right there. That's your preview of a federal resume for today. And you can see the all caps, right? So those all cap words are key words. Those are the words that are found in the vacancy announcement. So obviously this job that this person is applying for has a lot to do with pay administration, problem solving, education and training administration, and a couple of key accomplishments. That is it right there. I call it the outline format. I created this in around 2000, way back when DOD had a system called Resumex. It was an online automated system, and everybody just put 5,000 characters in a block and submitted. And it was terrible because nobody could read the resume. So I just thought, let's just break up the block into small paragraphs 
and have white space between each paragraph and use them all caps. And then it'll be easier to read. And there it is, right there. Easy to read. And the HR people really like it. If I had HR people in the class today, which I might, they would probably say that this is good. This is easy to read. They would, because obviously it is easy to read, right? So that's where we're going for our whole hour right there, that page right there. Now, I have a couple of before and after. So here's a before. This I call the big block. And I know it seems hard to believe that anybody would write a resume that looks like this, right? It's just not common sense because it's hard to read, but I see resumes that look like this that come out of the builder all the time. Your resume might look like this. If it does, you need to stop using it right now and change it because it's not good for HR. Okay, so that's terrible. You can't read it, can't see the keywords. This person, Jenny, is applying for a job, a promotion at NSA Naples Housing Office. She's a current nine and she's trying for an 11. So that's, that's bad. Now here's another one that's bad. This one is just bullet, just a little laundry list. It's not targeted. It says she's an administrative officer and she deals with operation level people. She does guidance for personnel and she directs the family and bachelor housing staff. Well, Okay, <laughs> just a few facts there. Now let's see the resume that got her hired. This resume got her promoted. There you go, look at this. So we put a description of the housing department right there with the uh, commander of naval installations in, um, it's really in uh, Naples, Italy. And the all cap words are ensure quality of life because this is housing. Housing program expertise. Okay, right, this job is housing, right. And personnel workforce management, that's important. And then marketing is important. And the resume is four pages long. And then look at the bullets. Those are little uh, accomplishment stories, conduct housing related studies to evaluate the impact of changes. Now you all working at VA have a lot of challenges today, having to deal with your new job um, descriptions and the way you're doing your job because of COVID-19. So you're probably maybe working virtual. And so you have new methods of working, new ways of achieving your, your goals um, with meetings. And I don't even know how you're doing your work virtual, but you definitely need to add it as an accomplishment that you have changed your uh, work methods and you might've created new tracking sheets and you probably have resolved some problems. If you're in the healthcare field of work, um, clinical hands, uh, you know, direct care, then obviously you have new job responsibilities since March 11. Uh, if you're purchasing, you have new responsibilities for purchasing all the PPE materials that are needed in, in your hospital and implementing safety and resilience processes. So every single person who's on this call, every person needs to write up something about your work under the new COVID-19 situation and services at the VA hospitals or wherever you are in the VA. If you don't mention it in your resume, you're not gonna look current. Everybody has to add it. We're talking to all our clients now about their work. I just taught seven classes for FAA a, couple, a month ago, all virtual and um, their job, they went 100% live to 100% virtual. And they have had to, you know, do all their work with meetings and agendas and inspections with cameras and um, it's really challenging. So make sure you do that. Now, if you do want to write something in the chat box, you could write in the chat box. Just, you know, you could write there, I, I do have new COVID-19 job responsibilities and, and uh, responsibilities and I will write them in the resume. You could just write something if you like about it because it's such an important part of your job today to ensure the safety of the patients, the residents, your staff, your coworkers. So this resume doesn't include it because this was done a couple of years ago because you know things are really different back then. So the accomplishments can go just like they are right here or they can go like this. See where it says key accomplishments at the end? You can type key accomplishments and then type here due to COVID-19, work restrictions involve the change a performance of duties and whatever it is you've done that's different. The accomplishments are what can help you to get referred to a supervisor. 
And that's the goal. The number one goal for your resume is to get best qualified. That's number one. And then number two is to get referred. And if you're referred, then maybe you will get an interview. You don't know. You know, it's up to the manager to decide. But if you have a resume that's compelling and has um, accomplishments and problem solving, uh, customer services, uh, any kind of challenges that you met, your chances of getting at the interview are going to be way better. So um, this is terribly important to add to the resume. And I would bet if you all had your resume right there in front of you, uh, you could see for your current job block that you may not have any accomplishments in it at all. It might just be written based on duties that you're responsible for every day. And that's probably not going to get you referred, really, because you've got to be more outstanding because there's so much competition. So that's, Can I ask that's you a question, right Catherine? There. Yeah. Can I ask you a question? So um, – I've seen resumes where people, it sounds as though basically they're taking their job description and they're putting it in their resume. So what you're saying is that's not going to get you the job. You have to make it very clear how you stand out from the rest, what your accomplishments are. Is that right? Absolutely true. The HR people know what a position description looks like. They know the language. They know the style of writing. And that's not going to work. You, you need to change it to uh, what you really do and who you work for. And I was working with a purchasing agent uh, just last week who's been a DS9 since 2008. And her resume was based on position description language. And it's really too bad. So I said to her, um, I need to know specifically what procurements you are buying and what services. This was VA also. I need to know what services you're buying for. And what programs, I need to know the dollars that you're spending. I need to know what products you're buying. And I need to know if you're working with new vendors or current vendors and how much money are you spending? And are you the prime person for this purchasing? She had nothing of that in the resume at all. Nothing specific. I had no idea what she was purchasing. And she wants to get a promotion to a GS-11. So guess what? <laughs> she got referred to both GS-11s we applied to. Yep. Oh, uh, that's fantastic. I drilled her. I drilled her. I made her tell me what she's, uh, what is she purchasing? And I got it from her. We put it down. She's thrilled. That's right. Great. And what are some other common mistakes you see people making with their resumes? Well, number one mm -hmm. common is they don't include any accomplishments at all. There's no specifics. That's one thing. Number two is uh, they don't describe their, their, complexity of their work. How many people, like it, with this residence that she was taking care of, there was a thousand residents in this place where she was purchasing for. She didn't have that in there. I had no idea how big this place was. Um, so describe something of the scope. So if you work in a hospital, how big is the hospital? If you work in a certain department, make sure you write what that department is and how many people you support or how many patients that you work with, some sort of numbers so that there's a visual picture of where you work, that always helps HR to envision your work. A lot of people don't identify the customers who they work with, who they talk to, who they provide services to or work, collaborate with. It's unbelievable. Another thing that they don't include is they don't include any laws or regulations that they uh, ensure that they comply with. So at the VA, of course, you've got Americans with Disabilities Act and you have the OSHA safety and there's probably new COVID regulations that you could write that you are compliant with, um, other laws and regulations, because, you know, you work for the government, and the government is filled with laws and regulations. So you could add a paragraph. She doesn't have it on here, but it could be a paragraph that would be called uh, Knowledge of Laws and Regulations, colon, and then you could put there that you implement and ensure compliance with these regulations. Add them. Great. Thank you. Yep. Okay, so the federal resume, I recommend you use a builder to build it, to get everything in there. They want to see the month and year for your jobs for like the last 10 years and the supervisor names and phone numbers if you can, although that's not mandatory. Um, street addresses for at least 10 years, hours for school. Let me say something about education right now. If, you, if your job requires a degree, like nursing or anything medical or a public health, Education should be listed before work experience if it's required. 
so that the HR manager don't have to go look for education because they're going to look for it first. So for nursing, you have to have an RN. For clinical uh, licensed social work, you have LCSW. All of that goes at the first, at the very beginning, and any kind of medical position or certain jobs, IT, you might need a certain certification. So if education and certification is required for the job, put it first. Now, when you go to USA Jobs, you're going to see it's not first. Uh, work history is first. So go ahead and use the builder, put everything in the builder, and then print preview it, take it out, put it into a Word file, and flip it. Move education to the top because education is very, very, very important for certain fields of work. So I like the builder, but I will tell you right now that if you submit with the builder, the resume, when it comes out for the manager to look at it, the type font is really small. It's 7.5 type. So, you know, we like resumes and work resumes to be 11 point type. So the builder printout is very small. I like the builder though, because it has the structure of what's needed, but I would really rather you submit with a paper resume that's copied out of the builder and make it 11 point type with one inch margin. That's, you know, more readable for managers and HR. So those are the basics of what to include. Now, strategy two, um, we talk about the outline format all the time. And um, so here's a sample set of hats for a maintenance person. They do maintenance mechanic, preventive maintenance, uh, communication. So if you were a public health person, let's say public health specialist, the hats that you wear in your work would be public health advisory services, research and development, data collection and performance metrics, uh, writing, communication, and maybe public speaking with communication. So those would be the hats that you would wear if you're in public health. So the book, if you get the Federal Resume Guidebook, which I would recommend, it's on my website and on Amazon also, there are a lot of samples of hats that you wear that you could think about your job. So here's one for an HR specialist at GS7. They do employee relations, they're a senior advisor, they have knowledge of employment law. So this is a way to build the outline format resume like in, you know, two minutes. For me, my hats that I wear, I'm an instructor, author, a federal, resident, federal career coach, I'm a webmaster, I'm a business manager. And those five hats I wear every day, all day. I, that's what I wear in my hat. So you could build the hats you wear in your job and build this outline format resume pretty easily. Here's another one for family program specialists. So this is a way of building that outline resume uh, based on the jobs that you do. Because if you look at your resume now, your bullets or your big black, you might not see the major hats that you wear in your job. It might be just all blended and HR can't find it. So uh, this is why it's good to start with this little exercise. And then, and then you take the hats and you type them in all caps. See that right there? And that's the beginning of the outline format resume right there. So nice. We start every resume with uh, five or six or seven keywords or hats and build a resume around those words. This is the, be the way to begin. And then later I'm going to show you the keywords from the announcement. You want to match your resume to the announcement all day long. So the keywords are found in this one section in the announcement. Well, they're found in three sections, but the big number one section is called qualifications. And every single announcement that you find has a section called qualifications. And then they have a section called required experience, specialized experience. You have to go find it. You have to, you have to, 100% mandatory. You have to find that tiny little paragraph and um, specialized experience. And it, and it will be five or six sentences long or eight, I don't know. Very easy to find and read. That's a section you have to match because the HR person, when they review their resume, they're going to be looking for one year specialized experience to match your resume. And then also you might find knowledge, skills, and abilities. A lot of the announcements have KSAs, and you have to make sure the resume covers those as well. You have to do that or you won't get best qualified, might, might not get referred. You have to do this. And then, of course, there's a self-assessment questionnaire that I'm sure you've all looked at. Resume needs to match that, too. So this is a great big match party here for your resume. And, yes, you do have to do this for each announcement. So if you apply to three jobs, one administrative officer, program analyst, public health advisor, there's going to be three sets of keywords. Sorry. But here's the good news. If you write your resume one time with the format that I'm recommending, like for Jenny, Let's say you write the resume for administrative officer for that resume. Then 
then you want to do program analysts. So that base resume is probably going to be 85, 90% ready to go, really. You're going to change some of the keywords with all cap words and add more um, language for analysis and quantitative and qualitative analysis and improving efficiency and effectiveness. So each announcement has a set of keywords that you want to match, but it could be only, you know, 10 to 20 words that you need to change. So it might only take you like an hour, hour and a half to revise it, each one. I really do recommend that you change it a little bit for each announcement. I know that's a terrible thing to say, but, you know, the HR people are looking for best qualified people. So, so what makes a key word? Well, there's some key words there from the announcement. Emergency management operations, you find them in the announcement. They're usually nouns or verbs. And um, so we're not going to do an exercise, but... That's where you find them is in the specialized experience section, and then you type them up in all caps. Now, the reason I do them in all caps instead of just bold, upper, and lower is that, like I said, HR people are looking at USA Staffing. It's an online dashboard, and I've seen it. I've actually seen it. I did a, a tour, and when they open up the resume, it's four inches by four inches. It's not eight and a half by 11. It's small. And so they only read that much, and then they scroll, 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 scroll. So that's why I want the education to go first, if education is required. And then the work history is next. And the all-cap words are just easier to stand out than bold, upper, and lower. But you could use either. There's no rule about it. It's just formatting for readability. Okay, now, here's the next strategy is accomplishment. So here's the question. What is the difference between an accomplishment and a duty in your job? So the duties are what you do every day. They're based on your position description. So my purchasing agent young lady um, did purchasing and she responded to purchase orders and um, research vendors and um, insured deliveries. And, you know, she did all that. But that was, those were her duties. Now, the accomplishments were that she had to purchase a lot of new materials starting March 14 to meet the uh, pandemic. And they were quick turn requests, and she had to research vendors and, and negotiate prices and make sure delivery was quick. It was incredible. That is an accomplishment. So that's the difference between the two is something specific versus the generic duties that you are working on. So the accomplishments will demonstrate your skills and expertise. They will certainly add interest. When I see a resume that has no accomplishments, like I see somebody that's been in a job for five or six or seven years, no, nothing highlighted. I'm just bored. I'm just bored in one second. And I think, I wonder what was challenging about this job. I wonder what problems they had to solve in this job. I wonder who they talked to. I wonder if they had any special projects. Did they set up a new database or a new website, or is there something new for cyber or IT? Everybody's got new cyber IT stuff. So I am very interested in being, seeing a resume that's interesting. And then they need to show your value. They need to show that you meet the mission of your organization, that you're compassionate and, and you work, you know, to meet deadlines, save money, uh, work to meet the mission. Managers love that. And all of that can increase your score. It really can. And hopefully prove that you're uh, most qualified, best qualified. And then the magic will get referred because the HR person, this human HR person, is the person who decides who's referred. And they might have 100 resumes to look at, and they're all best qualified, all 100, because the questionnaire was probably answered at the highest level. So they have 100 to choose from. Who's going to get referred? And they're only going to refer 10 people. So seriously, you need to think about that person and just, like, you know, really try to look outstanding and interesting and fascinating. And I'm the person who needs to go to the manager. I mean, really, put your head there and try to get referred because it's a great big game to try to get referred. <laughs> so here's a sample of an accomplishment. Here's a really bad one at the top. Receive recognition for participating in implementation of cybersecurity awareness campaign. Blah. Blah. More developed. Senior leadership selected me to lead an organization-wide cybersecurity awareness campaign because of my expertise. I had never done this before and came at a crucial time. Now, you can see we're using the word I here, right? Because this is something that this person did as a human, a person. I did this. I know you don't have any I's in your resume. I know. I know. But you need to add a couple I's so the resume is more personal and interesting. 
So I hand selected a team of five subject matter experts and tasked them with different components. Next, I coordinated with managers across the organization to define a rollout plan. Finally, with the strategy and rollout plan in place, I leveraged technology. What a story. You can write a story like this for one of your COVID changes that you've just implemented in your job. Just use the style right here. Now, I know you're thinking, oh my gosh, how many pages is this resume going to be? I already told you, five pages. Your current job block can be a, a, a whole page. It could even be a page and a half if you want. Your current job is your highest level, the most recent, most relevant. And if you have a couple of impressive examples, it can be 10 lines long, that's fine, or you can make them eight or seven lines long. But this is how you get referred. This is how you get an interview is by impressing. It really is. So if you if you go back and look at your resume later on today and find that you don't have any stories in it about outstanding things that you contributed to uh, your patients, customers, or anybody, you know what to do. <laughs> Start writing. Add to the resume. Now, this BCAR uh, acronym is what we use for storytelling. It stands for the context. Where were you working at that time? Challenge, what was the challenge? Actions, what did you do? And results, what happened? Um, on my website, resume-place.com, I have a CCAR builder that's really, really cool that you could use as a tool to help you to uh, write this content in the CCAR format. And these CCARs you're also gonna need for the interview because uh, the interview for government jobs is um, where you, uh, you tell stories. They tell you, they ask you a question, can you tell me about a time when you resolved the problem in your organization? What was that problem and what did you do and what happened? What were the results? CCAR story, problem solving story, you need to write it down ahead and practice it with your phone or somebody who will listen to you and that's your story. And then of course you put it in the resume because you wanna get referred, you wanna get the interview. So when, when I work with people, I, I ask for five CCARs if I can, which I do. <laughs> Okay, so accomplishments in the last five years. And the book has, I don't know, 20 samples of accomplishments in it. You really should get the book. Each accomplishment that's in the book is, you know, eight lines long. They're not short little things. They're stories, so you would get inspired to write more about yourself. A lot of federal employees have so much trouble thinking about things that they've done that are above and beyond, and they don't think about them as accomplishments. They just say, this is my job, this is my job. Um, one lady at, uh, it was a defense uh, medical uh, place in uh, Fort Detrick, Maryland, and she was contracting. And uh, she was sitting in the front, and I said, so what are you working on now that's unique? She said, nothing, I, I do contracting. I said, well, what are you contracting for? I had to really get her to talk, and she's sitting there like, mm. So she said, well, uh, what I'm working on now is I'm purchasing uh, nuclear medicine, x-ray equipment for all the ships in the Navy. <laughs> she actually said that. I said, all the ships in the Navy? That's a lot. Wow. She said, yeah, they're turning over from digital, from analog to digital. I said, oh, my gosh. So you have to integrate the equipment with um, the digital and, and web and everything too, right? Yeah. I said, Who, who's getting the equipment off all the ships and, you know, measuring and everything? I'm, I'm getting all that done. So, well, uh, how long have you been working on this? Two years. <laughs> how to make a great story boring, right? I mean, really. Okay. So, she is the contact lead for all the x-ray, new x-ray equipment for the ships of the U.S. Navy. And, you know, she, she doesn't even tell me how many ships there are, there are thousands. She didn't even tell me how many different kinds of ships there are. Who knows? But she could put that in the resume. It'll be interesting. And now she's going to get referred. Okay? She's going to be referred because it's interesting. It's just interesting. So we got her to put it down. And I have to really encourage people to do that. Okay. Core competencies. Now, core competencies are, are soft skills. Now, this, this section in the book has really changed a lot because um, the vacancy announcements now include core competencies that you need to cover in your resume. So make sure you look for them. So on this page, 58 and 59 in the book, you'll see the OPM competencies that they created that are good and VA uses them too. So you could look at all of them and check off some of them and put them in your resume. Customer service is so important. And uh, when, I, when I used to teach classes live, it was just really funny. I would say to everybody, because everybody would have their resume in front of them. And I'd say, okay, now everybody, look at your resume. 
and see if you can see the words customer service on your resume or the word customer anywhere. No, <laughs> hardly anybody had it because, you know, they just didn't think of it. And the entire federal government does customer service work, you know, eight hours a day. So this, chap this is good, 58, 59 in the book. You need to look at the book. Now, you do need to look at mission statements. Find one for VA or your organization or VHA or VBA and read it. Stick it on the wall or the refrigerator so that you can make sure your resume reflects that you work to meet the mission every day. Really good. Managers love that. So find it and look at it. So the announcements now have these competencies. So here's one for IT, those four competencies there. If you don't include those four competencies and address that you have attention to detail customer services, as an IT person, you probably will not get referred. These are mandatory, mandatory. And customer service is really important because a lot of IT people don't talk about how they talk to, pay, to, to clients and customers and, and interview them about their problems with IT. They just leave it out. But if I had a class of IT people right here and I would say to the class, I'd say, what percentage of your day do you spend interviewing and working and talking to your customers? They'd say 80%, 70%. Then look at your resume, doesn't even mention it. So, you know, pay attention to these. Then if you're going for a logistical job, oh my gosh, logistics is so big right now, isn't it? On the news with taking the vaccine out for by the National Guard, this is logistics wildfire. Man alive, this would work. Operational supply, planning, evaluating, life cycle, communications. Those are good. Those are really good. They would work for guard. Okay, six, firing hire process. So I mentioned this before a couple times. HR people, human people read the resume first. So VA uses regular HR people to read resumes to see if you are going to be eligible and qualified and best qualified. And then they also decide referred. So they're very important. And they look at the specialized experience and see if you match. Then if you're lucky enough to get referred, the resume is on the desk of a hiring official. And there's like only 10 people there. So you really could get picked up for an interview if you are referred. So those are the two readers. And with the outline format and the accomplishments, we're trying to give the information to both at the same time. So there's something on OPM's website called the classification standard. And um, it's a little bit technical, it's kind of HR-ish, but there's parts of it that I really like. Um, guidelines is one of them. I, I love to see resumes that include the guidelines that you follow, like I said before, OSHA, ADA, FAR for acquisitions, um, whatever laws and regulations the VA has that you need to follow. Honestly, you need to type them in the resume because you have knowledge and you interpret these guidelines and follow them, add it. I also like um, personal contact, that's customer services. I also like scope and effect. That's where you would say how big your hospital or your organization is or the scope of your job. Like if you're regional or national or local, I don't know what your scope is. How would I know unless you tell me? Um, purpose of contact would be in there, whatever the mission is that you do. Um, complexity would be the accomplishments. So this little list here is kind of good, and you can find out more about these in um, at OPM's website. You can go to the classification standards and uh, look up your series or the series you're going for and read the OPM standard, and you'll find some language like this. So look at the point thing here. They give you points on how you write this content. So you can get up to 750 points. This is for a public affairs person. 750, level one through five, is that you show basic knowledge of written and communication principles. That gives you 750. Now, if you want to get 1850, you need to show mastery of communications principles that you advise public affairs people. That's 1850. So the, the more complex uh, and more details and specifics you add to the resume, the better your score is going to be for your federal resume. And no, don't be asking anybody about your score and your resume. They're not going to give it to you. Just don't. It's just basic. what you want to know is eligible, qualified, best qualified referred. Those are the scores that you want to follow on your account. There's a web page for the classification standards. If you haven't looked at it, you should go and look at it. If you want to get a promotion or change your job series, this is the basis of the announcements for USA Jobs. So 
um, you should really take a half an hour and find your job in there and read about it. Okay, strategy seven. Okay, these are words to not add to your resume uh, because they just kind of, um, they're not that impressive and they're old school, they're bureaucratic. So if you have responsible for duties include, helped with, worked with, assisted with, those words should be taken out. So instead of assisted with, you would say, you know, let's say you say assist, assist with planning and coordinating medical services. So forget assist with, plan and coordinate medical services. You don't need to say you assist because you actually do it, don't you? If you say assist, that means you're not really doing it. You're assisting someone else is doing it. No, nope, that's not good. Serve as, you don't need that. Just say what it is you're serving as and skip the serve as. Responsible for, skip that. It, it might say responsible for directing the development of a database system. Responsible for directing development of database systems. So forget responsible for and say direct the development of a database system. Just take them out. They take up a lot of characters. It's just not good. And work with assisted with is terrible because it implies that you're not really doing the work, you're helping someone else to do it. So this is also in the book with a lot of samples. You should read them. Now, tenses. So current tenses, you know, um, lead for technical services, repair desktop, and then past tense would be planned and delivered. So just, you know, and your current job, you might have both present tense and past tense. Past tense would be accomplishments that are already finished, and uh, present tense would be current. I would like to see you use the word I in your resume maybe three to five times on page one. Do it in the accomplishments a section where you can say, I did this and that. That sample I showed you before was good. And you can see more samples of it if you look at the accomplishments in the book. It just makes the resume more personal and um, less PD-ish. So uh, try to use I a little bit. It, here's a good example. After extensive research, I was able to convey to all personnel covering nine, seven different agencies, the proper use and dispatch of government vehicles within Europe. Wow, I did that? I, I, uh, you did that? The fourth, the SOFA stipulates if a European country is not part of this agreement, government vehicles cannot be driven there without proper authorization. Well, that's impressive. <laughs> I, you see the I is good there. It's really powerful. Okay, A, design. Well, our format, the outline format works. The HR people like it because it's easy to read. We use the HATS format with uh, all caps keywords. And um, the keywords come out of the announcement. I really like uh, the 11 point type, one inch margins, look, type font, you know, typical, just be a standard, don't do anything fancy, Arial or, or uh, Helvetica or something. Now, USA Jobs, I said this before, I'll say it again. If you submit with the builder, which you can, uh, the builder resumes, the printout, come out in 7.5 type. And I've seen them. When I used to do classes live, people always brought their resume to the class. And so I would talk about it, and somebody in the room would hold up their resume like this, and they would go, yeah, see this? See this? And I would look at it, and there it would be, a black type resume, all squished, small type. And then this person might have been a really impressive person, and their resume is ruined by the builder. So use the builder to build the resume, then copy it out and put it into a Word file, and then you'll have it. And it'll be 11-point type, so it'll be fine. Strategy nine, this is my last strategy, and then I'm going to answer questions. The questionnaire is really something else. It is a test, it is a pretest, and the score for your questionnaire is looked at before the resume. Because the score makes a difference because all agencies have a cutoff. The score cutoff could be 94, 98, 100. The uh, HR person that I was coaching with who showed me her screen, she was looking at an announcement that received 148 resumes. And, um, I saw the scores right down the middle. I saw 98, 94, 78, 80, 60. I saw the scores right down the middle. And her cutoff was 100. 
So she only looked at the uh, resumes of people who got 100 on the questionnaire. So she only had to look at 40 resumes. 40, 40 out of 148 did 100%. That was pretty something. So she looked at those and she forwarded on eight people out of the 40 that she looked at. So the score, and make sure you give yourself all the credit that you can on the questionnaire. So here's the typical, this is the one they use a lot. They don't always use it now because they're changing it. But the highest level is usually E or five, or they might flip it and it's A, you know, you can't tell. So here it is, it's the highest level. Um, resolving problems such as failure to be promoted, uh, irregularities. Okay, I have supervised this task or I've trained other people in the performance or I'm normally consulted by others as an expert for assisting in this, in this task. So there's three ways that you could check off this highest level. You've been a supervisor, you have trained other people in this work, and you are consulted by other people to help them. So read your questions carefully and look at the E level, the highest level, and see if you can give yourself credit from this job or a previous job or another job so that you can say the highest level so you can get the highest score that you can because they're going to look at that questionnaire score first. Now the questionnaires are getting extremely creative. So look at them before you apply because they're not always typical like this one. VA has some really creative questionnaires. Be very careful. Take your time. So that's all I've got on the questionnaire. So each person that's going to attend the class can uh, get a copy of 14 pages of my book. Uh, that will uh, be emailed or you can download it from somewhere. Uh, the book is 180 pages long and it has 17 samples of resumes in it. So I think you should uh, get the book um, instead of just listening to me because you need to see samples. Maybe I can show it to you. Hold on. So let me um, just be clear here, Catherine. So I'm assuming that this PowerPoint is your intellectual property. So uh, we will not be um, giving out this PowerPoint. Instead, you've kindly offered um, part of your book. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. That's right. The PowerPoint, you can't uh, sh share with anybody, but you can with the um, this, this PDF that I'm creating for you. It's 14 pages of the book, and uh, you're welcome to um, send it to everybody who comes to the class so that they can see what else is in the book. The entire table of contents is in there. And, okay. Um, and uh, the first sample is in there. So they can see what's in the book. There are 17 federal resume samples in the book and 20 accomplishment stories and uh, 13 of them, um, 13 keyword samples. So, you know, if people want to get promoted, they need to look at the book, look at more samples and spend more time on their resume and, you know, maybe get a coach. They want more. Yeah. Help. <laughs> right. Now, um, I'm curious about the questionnaire. I have heard that if you don't rate yourself either for a, a four or five, you, you there's no way you'll make the cert. Do, do you agree with that? I sure do. It's the truth. It's the truth. Yeah. You've got to give yourself all the credit you can and hopefully get 100 or 90 and Sometimes I have to coach people, let's say they know they're a highest level on all of them but one. And that one they've never heard of or have done it, you know, not independently or something. So they could just check off E if they want to try to get this qualified, but you don't want to do that for like five of them. You shouldn't apply. But if you right. are a really, really good candidate and you know all the questions perfectly except one, I'd try to go for 100. Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. Um, and we have a bunch of questions here. Um, uh, someone is asking, how far back should you go in your resume in terms of your experiences? Is it 10 years? 10 years is uh, good. Uh, you can go back further if you want. Just keep it very short in the earlier positions. Uh, the most recent 10 years, the most recent five years is what they're really going to look at. So um, emphasis on five to 10 years. Okay, great. Um, in terms of the length, you said three to five pages. What if you're a physician and you have papers, publications, presentations, things like that? Is that length also appropriate for physicians? No, it could be a little longer. They could have their presentations, publications, um, maybe seven pages, but not much longer. Okay. Yeah. Great. 
Um, and what do you think about cover letters? Necessary? Well, um, they're optional, but I was told by my HR coach who I met with that if the job involves writing as one of the skills, that the cover letter could be a good thing because a manager could read the cover letter and see if you can write. So a lot of jobs don't require writing. So for those that don't require writing, you could skip it. And if you, if you go to my website, resume-place.com, I've got a, a cover letter builder as well as SD card builder tool. And you could look at that cover letter builder. It is really good. It'll help you write a cover letter. It's free. It's just sitting there. Oh, great. Um, so a couple of questions about uh, the resume builder. So it's in block form. So are you, and there's some questions about how to deal with that. So for, um, what you were saying is go ahead to use that to build your resume, but then convert it into Word. Is, is that how, is that how you, you would recommend? Mm -hmm. you, can't, you can't convert it. You, you have to uh, print preview the resume that you have in there and copy it out and put it into Word. And you definitely don't have to have a block in that 5,000 character block. You can have seven paragraphs that are seven lines long with white space between. You, the, the, um, the builder is fine for the outline format, but don't use it because the type font's too small. Just copy right. it out and make it 11 point type and then submit that way. Okay, great. Okay. Have, um, have you seen that yourself, Maura? Have you seen resumes that are builders? Resumes versus uh, print resumes. Have you seen it? I've gone through resumes that have very small print. And when you have a stack of resumes before you, I can tell you it makes me pretty cranky <laughs> looking at yes, that tiny right. print. Absolutely. The tiny print is very hard to read for managers who have to read. Well, a manager might read 10, but an HR person is going to open up 30 resumes on their screen. Yeah. So, you know, you just need to make it easier to read. And, uh, you know, if you look online and read any online uh, newspaper, social media, or anything, they use small paragraphs. They don't use big blocks of text. Mm -hmm. So don't do that. The other thing I have found when I go through stacks of resumes is it makes it much easier for me as I'm looking at resumes if they use the same language that's in the application. Sometimes I feel like people don't want to repeat themselves or they want to, you know, they want to be more creative in their descriptions. But honestly, when I get tired, I just want, like, I, I, I just want to know that they have the experience that is in the job announcement. So taking that language that's in the announcement, right. it, it makes it easier at, for me, someone reviewing the resumes. Well, absolutely. The resume I have in front of you here for the uh, housing person, the words that were in the announcement were ensure quality of life, housing program, personnel, workforce, and marketing. Those are the words in the specialized experience paragraph. And there they are for you and HR to find and see. Right? Mm -hmm. Yep. And um, your federal resume guidebook, that's that's the name. That's the actual name. Like, so if you go on Amazon and you search for Federal Resume Guidebook, that's where we'll find it, right? Yep, right on Amazon or my website, resume placecom You can order an ebook version from me, or um, of course, Kindle is out there too. And I, I, you know, I wrote the book way back then to help people see good sample resumes, and and that's what's in it. It's sample resumes that are successful. Every single sample that's in there is a real person who got hired. And they all know they're in there. They're all fictionalized. And they're all in the outline format. They all include accomplishment stories to help you get inspired. So I just really think the book would help a lot if you could get it and look at more samples and follow the styles that are there. And then you can look at my website. I've got blogs that I write on what's important for resumes. So it's a big, big topic. <laughs> if you want to get a promotion, this is how you do it. The resume yeah. is key. So... Say you want to shift your job and kind of move in a new direction that you don't have a lot of experience in. What do you recommend for something like that? Yeah, that's going to be hard. <laughs> that's going to yeah. be hard. Because yeah, I, I hear it, though. Mm -hmm. like, well, they need to go they get the experience. Get so the announcement will, will probably say, say one year specialized one year experience, experience and one, two, three. Two, three. Mm -hmm. So they're going to have to get it as a detail or as a volunteer. 
as a special as a project, project. You, you, have you have to have, have it. To have it. You, you can't <laughs> apply for a job if you don't have the experience that's written in the qualification section. It's, it's just not creative. It's not. We do career change resumes all the time. Mm -hmm. And we translate skills from one set of skills to another. So a lot of people like an NIH, they're tired of doing the clinical scientific stuff. They want to do policy and, you know, public advocacy and stuff. So we change clinical to policy and, and clinical to writing and clinical to research. So we translate. But it has to be there to translate. And, and in the book, there is a chapter for samples of career change resumes. In the book, there's a, a clinical social worker who wants to become a park ranger. And then we have a truck driver who became a maintenance mechanic for the Navy. Um, there's a couple of career change samples in the book as well. Oh, that's so helpful. And I just want to kind of put a plug in for IDPs here, individual development plans. And I tell people all the time, you know, go out and look for your dream job. See what kind of skills you need for that job. Put them on your yeah, IDP yeah. so you can develop them and get experience doing that thing, whether you're volunteering, whether it's through a shadowing assignment, a detail assignment, a stretch mm -hmm. assignment at your current position. Um, just start right. getting that experience. And to do that, use your IDP. Absolutely. I, I recommend that highly. Um, you need to have the experience to show on the announcement of one year specialized. One lady, I, young lady, I remember, I taught a class at the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, and she was in the class a while ago. And uh, she said that she was a U.S. postal worker, uh, letter carrier, before she came to work at CMS. And I said, well, how did you do that? And she said, I volunteered at my church to help senior people and people with disabilities sign up for Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid. And I did it for several years and weekends and evenings. I did it 20 hours a week. And I wrote it on my resume as my knowledge of CMS and the um, beneficiary, beneficiary uh, policies and procedures. And that is how I got hired from that volunteer job right there. Excellent. Yeah, that's how, that's how I became an instructor. I volunteered at a community center to teach a topic on career development. And okay. that's what gave me the experience to move up. Yep. So important. Volunteer experience. So important. It is. And, and the way that you use it in the resume is you write a whole job block up on it. You put month and year, hours per week, where you are, supervisor, what you're doing, the knowledge you have. You write it up like a job that you're paid for. And then for salary, you just put down zero. But you put your hours per week and you write it up and you put those skills in it that you need to sell, you know, to present to HR. And that is a way that you can show that you're best qualified and hopefully referred. And she did. She's sitting right there in the room. Got hired. Health wow. insurance specialist. Yep. Wow. Excellent. Um, and I have to I have to say to everyone, this is a new platform we're working on today. And I I get the sense I may not have seen all of the questions, but um Yes. So, uh, oh, there's one question here about uh, investing in coaching. When do you? When is it time for you to invest in getting coached on your resume? I think it's a good idea. Anytime uh, we provide a coaching service on Resume Place website, we charge one ninety for an hour. And what we do is we look at your resume, we look at the announcement, and we tell you everything that's wrong with your resume. <laughs> Just oh wow! So much fun. I know it's so much fun. We read the announcement. We read the specialized experience. We look at the keywords. We look at the resume. Boom, they're not there. Okay, so not one keyword is there. That's a problem. And then we look and see education is buried at the bottom. And the courses are not listed. There's no accomplishments. It's boring. It's incredible. It's a really, really good service. And then you could go fix it. You can take all our ideas, get the book and fix it yourself. It's affordable. I think coaching is a great thing instead of like my young lady I was coaching 10 years, you know, come on, get some help. You can get promoted yeah. if you have a good resume that speaks to those qualifications. So it's a good right. idea. Great, great. Um, www.resume-place.com um, is the yeah. website. Catherine, thank you so much for coming back to VA You're today. Yeah, Catherine, and just so you much. all, yeah, and and so you all know, Catherine was with us once before. You can find a recording 
of that on our SharePoint site, and we shared the link a little bit earlier in this presentation, um, the SharePoint site uh, for the Distinguished Speaker Series. What you'll also find there are um, is some information on our upcoming um, sessions, including our January 14th session uh, with Pulitzer Prize winning uh, author, uh, Charles Dewey, he wrote a book called The Power of Habit, January 14th, our next session. I hope you can be there Great. for that. Yeah, happy holidays, everyone, and we'll see you in the new year. Thanks for being here. Take care, everybody. Thanks, uh, happy New Year. Happy new year.